very warm welcome to everyone for this uh, humanities and social sciences event at IIT Gandhinagar. Uh, we are doing this talk digitally because of the whole situation, but I think to look at it uh, positively, there are some good sides to the fact that we can actually have this conversation right now with uh, all of us in different cities, possibly in different places, in different parts of the world. So, a first housekeeping announcement, if I may request all of you joining in to kindly keep your microphones muted so that there is no noise. Uh, the way we'll go about it is I'll just do a very brief introduction to our topic of discussion today and introduce uh, both uh, Molaira Choudhury and Daniela Capello. Uh, and I'll give it over then to Daniela uh, so that we can begin the conversation. Now, just to say a few things, uh, my name is Orko Chattopadhyay. I teach in the Humanities and Social Sciences Department here. And my background is in literary studies and philosophy. And specifically, I work on modernist literature, which is one of the framing points, I suppose, for today's discussion. Uh, now, to, to uh, do a more informal introduction to uh, Molaida, as we fondly call him with a Bengali honorific da at the end, uh, I should say that I don't know him only as an academic. In fact, my uh, connection with him is more as uh, a writer uh, who shares the language with Malayda. We also share a hometown here, Uttarpara, where we both come from, in a sense, which is interesting. Uh, so I've, I've known Malayda for a number of years, and I've had the, uh, the, the opportunity to write on him in, in Bengali, primarily. Uh, and in fact, that's how I started to talk to him almost a decade back now. And he has been a very encouraging senior writer in various ways, a uh, historically significant writer, one of the chief exponents of the movement that we will talk about today, Hung Realism. Now, let me just uh, say just a few introductory words. Of course, Daniela and Molaida will uh, keep it going and will intensify the conversation. But Hungryalism, as the title itself suggests, is some sort of an interesting manipulation with the form of realism in literature. Uh, sometimes it's also called the Hungry Generation. And this movement was launched in the beginnings of 1960s, in 1961, to be precise. And there were multiple manifestos that were written. Uh, one of them was in English, if I'm not mistaken. This was a very important uh, what is called avant-garde or experimental literature movement in the history of not just Bengali Indian literature, but also in the history of global modernisms. Because again, when we think of the, the scenario of the 60s, we are looking at this very interesting exchange of ideas and a cross-pollination that is happening. We have the likes of uh, Allen Ginsberg, Orlovsky and others coming to Kolkata, coming to India, coming to visit India, essentially. And there's a very interesting chain of uh, exchanges that start with at least two groups in Bengali literature. One is the group of writers uh, congregated around the magazine Krithibash. And the other is, of course, hung realism that we are going to talk about today. And it's interesting how uh, the Eurocentric dimension of literary history often uh, in a way eclipses the fact that the hungry generation and the beat generation of writers, these, these dialogues are not one-sided. It's not just that the beats inspired the hungries and that's it. Uh, we have a much more complex and a much more dialogic network of associations. And especially as a modernist studies scholars these days, when we talk very strongly about modernist networks, uh, global modernist networks, I believe we are looking at a very important historical chapter, not just in the history of Bengali and Indian literature, but also in the history of global modernism, how these ideas travel from one part of the world uh, to another. But that does not mean there is an aping of ideas. What we are talking about is a very important appropriation of ideas that might come from a different part of the world. And the dialogue, as the word dialogue itself suggests, is of course both sided. It's, it's, it's reciprocal, it's not one-sided. And I think these and many other interesting things, how Hungry Movement launched a, a kind of a rebellion against the orthodox canon of Bengali literature, 
uh, shall I say, the Brahminical canon of Bengali literature as well in certain ways, how there were certain openings around caste lines. There are very interesting questions that I'm sure this conversation will, will underpin. I'll keep it uh, short here and let me just go to a more uh, maybe a professional introduction of our uh, two speakers, of our participants today. Uh, Molay Rai Chudhuri uh, was born in Patna in 1939. Again, a very important point, the fact that we are talking about a Bengali writer who has written from outside West Bengal almost all his life. Uh, he yeah, is a well-known Bengali poet and writer who originally emerged with the avant-garde movement, as I said, Hungry Generation, in 1961. This was a group of transgressive poets from West Bengal and other parts of Eastern India who breached the middle-class norms, as well as the aesthetic rules of literature through their rough language, their highly sexualized imagery, and bohemian lifestyles. So we'll try and get a glimpse of those years through the eyes of one of the early members and initiators of the Hungry Generation. To introduce uh, Daniela Capello, Daniela Capello is a doctoral candidate in modern South Asian studies at Heidelberg University. She did her postgraduate studies in Naples and her Erasmus in Paris, where she studied Indology and modern South Asian studies, developing a keen interest for issues about language, modernity, and transgression in Bengali literature. For her doctoral research, she has worked on the poetry of the hungry generation, exploring issues of sexuality, masculinity and transgression in their Bengali writings. She has edited the Bengali translation of Antonio Gramsci's 25th prison notebook and authored articles on translation and science fiction comics. So a very warm welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for being, uh, for agreeing to be part of this. I'm sure I'm, and I and everyone else, we're all looking forward to a great dialogue here. And I must also thank Carola, uh, a, a dear colleague who has been quite instrumental in, in fact, suggesting we have an event like this with Daniela playing such an important role. And of course, I'm, I'm honored to have uh, Mola Rai Choudhury here, who has taken out his time uh, for this. So thank you so much to everybody. And I give over to Daniela. Uh, please let me know when to start the PowerPoint, and I'll do that. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Orko. Thank you for having me here, for organizing this great event something that I've decided to call a conversation with Moloi Raichoudhury, which that if, if he will um, allow me, I would like to address here as Moloi Da myself. I will not say Dadu this time. That's a bit more, um, more personal in a way. Dadu meaning grandfather, right? Um, so I've decided to, to name this, uh, um, the seminar actually in conversation with Mono exactly because I had a lot of uh, questions that uh, I wanted to ask him and uh, that have popped up while writing my dissertation and while uh, working on the hungry generation. Of course, there have been um, various encounters already with Molloy while I was in, a, in a Mumbai and when I went to his uh, apartment to have a talk with him. But somehow while writing the thesis, um, which is a completely different stage in research, other questions have popped up. I was thinking actually to start very much with the, um, with the personal and the, some bio, biographic details uh, in, the, in, in the early life of uh, the poet Molloy Rai Choudhury, because I think that biographic details, especially when we are dealing with um, confessional poetry are very important. And um, yeah, this is why I was uh, thinking to start um, to ask actually Molloy Da to share some of his early childhood memories um, that have to do a lot with the place in which he was born and in which he grew up, which was Patna in Bihar, and even more specifically to the neighborhood of Imlitola, which he um, addresses uh, significantly in his early memoirs, that he has claimed to be very important for his, uh, um, for his person, but also for his writings and his later works. So to start with, I would first of all ask Orko, please, to start the PowerPoint because we have a couple of pictures on, um, actually pictures of pictures, pictures of photographs, unfortunately, 
on uh, on of that uh, of that place and um, yes um, and starts by by talking to Molon. So we know that your you and your family are from part nine. This is something that Orko is already um, um, interestingly uh, pointed to. The fact that we are talking about Bengali writers who write in Bengali from outside Bengal. I think this is a very interesting point in, in the hungry generation, generally speaking. Uh, but you were actually from Patna and your family claims to descend from Shaborno Rai Chaudhuri, as you were reminding us uh, yesterday, who was a uh, zamindar actually in the late 18th century, I think. Who, and who was, of course, you're going to tell us more about it, who was one of those who, um, uh, who saw, who built one of the, the early villages that later became Calcutta, and then later sold it to, uh, sold it, just to use, just pass me the word, to the British, to the East India Company by the time. Um, but of course, by the time you were born, uh, this kind of um, descendants in a way was lost in terms of uh, lands and, um, and privileges. And only the title Rai Chaudhuri uh, has remained right with all the cultural and social history behind that title. Uh, so I think that already this contradiction in narrating about yourself uh, sums up a little bit your style and your work. So how do you think that Patna and Imlitola, as well as the history of your family, was uh, significant to you and to your literary persona? If you could tell us a little bit about your early childhood memories and um, yes, about this uh, interesting place uh, in Patna. The photograph you are seeing now is that of my father's shop. This is my father's shop in Dariyapur. This is not Imlitara. We shifted to this area around, I think, uh, 56. Prior to that, we lived in Imlitara. Area. You got photographs of Imlitala also. But in this house, the Hungry Generation movement was started in 1961. That is Devi Roy, Shukti Chantubad, my elder brother, Samir, and myself. We started it from here, this building. On the upper floor, we used to stay. My father had a shop, is downstairs. The shop is now being run by Samir's elder son and in this house Allen Ginsberg had come and he had stayed in 1963 on the uh, upper floor room which you can see on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. so, uh, if you show me the Imlitola area photograph. I think uh, the second picture must be Imlitola although it's uh, it's just a galley you know it's just an alley. Uh, this is Imlitola. Mm -hmm. This is Imlitala, but earlier, when we stayed in our childhood, this area had only huts. That is, tiled huts were there. And in this area, now this is completely developed or being developed probably. The left hand side where a lady is seated, that was our house. And others, all others were uh, huts. All huts. Ours were not hut. It was a brick and mortar uh, house. Others were huts. But in this area, almost all people came from what at that time were called untouchables. Now they are called Mahadalits. They were untouchables. I think they have left the place and they have sold it to builders. And you see a lamppost on the left side. If you go on the left side, there is a, was a lane. In that lane, at the end of the lane, we were uh, there were uh, uh, people who used to stay there. They uh, had a uh, compound where most of them were uh, pickpockets, decoys. Uh, oh and thieves and all other people like that. Because we used to know whenever police came, at that time, police was having that red pugray. So they used to 
we called Mureta. And the dogs there used to inform whenever the dogs saw those policemen, they used to start barking. And those people, the thieves, record pickpockets, they would climb on the tiles and run away backwards. And there was a mango garden and drop there in the mango garden and flee away. But we knew that something big was going to happen in the evening. That is, a pig was put inside a pit, five feet, six feet deep pit, and uh, iron rods, hot iron rods were pierced into those pits. And we were studying in the evening. We could hear the shrieks. And all my uh, aunts and uh, my mother, they would say, see, now they are going to have a big party in the evening. We also knew that we will also participate in that party. So we would sneak and go into that party. Especially Samir was very much interested in that party. I would follow Samir. We had another brother, my uncle, elder, eldest uncle from old. He didn't have a son. So when Samir was born, my grandfather and grandmother was very happy because he was the first son in our family. Of all the brothers of my father, my Samir was the first. So my grandmother was very happy with Samir. That is why my uh, uncle, eldest uncle Pramod, he purchased a boy for 150 rupees. And we didn't know that he was a purchased brother. Afterwards, we came to know that he was purchased. But all three of us will go there and participate. We would drink toddy, we would drink country liquor, and come back after eating the, uh, I don't know, it, it is neither smoked uh, nor it is simply burnt, burnt pig flesh, we would eat and come back. In our house, there was no restriction on that. So you can imagine that we were a part of the, uh, what you call, now call Mahadali. Now there is a division in the society. At that time, the division was only between, I think, the rich and the poor. Now there is a caste division. A lot of castes are being divided. OBCs, Dalits, Mahadalis, etc. I don't, don't know the present situation in Blitala. But Moloida, uh, talking about all these um, different um, communities with which you were living in Imlitola, right? You say you were living with Dalit Hindus, and I think I've read somewhere else that you, you were, of course, cohabiting also with Muslim communities. Um, and I think these are all people that you would call people at the margins, living subalterns, right, so to say. And in fact, I think that this uh, idea of Chotolok, like of small people, or literally small people, but actually low class people, or the lumpen proletariat really, is very central also to the way you started to develop your idea of poetry. And I think it's very much present also in, in your later works. For example, we have a Chotolok El Kobita. You've written this poetry on the low, low class or low caste people. Uh, so was it actually really important for, for your work? And uh, how do you think you have uh, actually, in a way, used all, this, uh, all these experiences and put them in your, in your writings? No, I have written Chotolok El Chotovala also, or who had reviewed, I think. Chotoloker Chotolok Bala and Chotoloker Jugo yes. Bala. The memoir, yeah. That is uh, my memoirs of childhood. Now, uh, we were not a part of the culture. That, uh, that is Bengali culture or say the Indian culture as a whole. We were not a part of the culture. Neither the people who stayed in the area were a part of the culture. They were all outsiders. So we also were outsiders. And we were, they were called Chotolok. And people used to call them Chotoloker Para. That is, uh, para, the locality of the margins, you can call. 
you can see here in this photograph i am seated on the floor two of my sisters cousin sisters on are on two sides their heads were shaved because they were having uh, i don't know what it is called kukun or who will say what it is called that is why their heads were shaved here in the middle on chair is my elder brother dandruff dandruff is the word yeah my elder brother samir is there that is the only chair purchased in in our house samir purchased it from an auction some auction was going on so samir came to my mother and asked for 2 rupees and he purchased that chair so he had uh, he owned that chair and he used to sit on the, that chair and the boy standing is the boy who was purchased by my elder uncle pramod that boy died at the age of 15 when he came to know that he is not uh, from our family he stopped talking in bengali he started talking in hindi he left school he became a gunda sort of gunda that is a part of the he became a part of himli tola he is sort of a leader in himli tola and you can imagine as uh, but we were a, a complete group of brothers and sisters who uh, belong to uh, to that outsiderness you can find out that they were having uh upun is not andra uh, food i don't know that is small insects lices 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 sorry that was yeah i'm going to sorry they brought lies from the area in their hair so every summer they will be uh, their heads will be shaved during uh, holidays anyway uh, this was my uh, the fund of words also gradually i started thinking that the fund of words in the area in which we lived were different from the hindi spoken outside Mm-hmm. my mothers and aunts they also spoke in the language of the area uh, in the language of himli tola hindi not outside sophisticated hindi afterwards when we shifted to daryapur because that was a different a slightly richer area we came to know that the language in which my mother aunts talk they were otherwise oshlil that is they were using words which otherwise will be called obscene they didn't know that these words are obscene but they use it freely freely with the people who were living there in imlitola inside our house there was a well that well has to be uh, that is well for drawing water the imlitola ladies used to come there inside our house and around the well during their marriages they will start singing songs completely obscene songs i don't know whether you have heard bhojpuri songs later nowadays also bhojpuri songs are more or less obscene but at that time it was very obscene we were not able to understand what they are they were telling but gradually afterwards when we started understanding the local uh, dialect local dialect and uh, the uh, that is uh, imageries they were using those imageries also were uh, obscene and that is why my elder uncle closed that well so that they didn't come and my elder uncle okay. and my father used to tell that this well is where shersha had come and chanakya had come and all the bimbisar and ashok had come so that is why it is a famous well and we are going to close it because they are singing obscene songs but these songs are not meant for this well this well is very famous in history 
Well, you you have given us a lot of interesting anecdotes and yeah. um, and already you you are addressing a very important issue, which I think is language, right? Yeah. Already and we have you are giving. That huh? is the fund of words that uh, we get uh, that we get in the chotulo uh, uh, vocabulary is was at that time. Now people use it very freely, even in Facebook. Uh, girls also use it very freely. At that time, it was unbelievable that people will use that those words, and for girls, it, it was. A, Unbelievable that they will be using such words, in, such words in poetry also. Even in printed poems, girls are using, ladies are using those words. So it was not uh, at that time. Uh, it was not allowed. Or at that time, the magazines were apparently what Orko just now said, somewhat Brahminical. The language also was Brahminical. That is, Brahminical means it came from the Brahmo Samaj. That is, the leading lights of Bengali literature were all Brahmos, Ramon Rai, Rabindranath, Jibodananda, people who directed the uh, literature, Bengali literature in a particular direction. They were all Brahmo. I studied, although in a Catholic school, but afterwards, when my my Bengali was getting corrupted because of Imlitala and Catholic school English and home Bengali. So my mother said, let him uh, study in a Bengali medium school. That is why I was sent to a Brahmo school, Ramohan Rai Seminary. And in that Brahmo school, I came to know about writers. That is, there was <coughs> a librarian <clears throat> a librarian named Nomita uh, Chakravarti. She introduced me to writers. That is, she told me to read certain books, which I afterwards found out that they were of uh, Rabindranath Jivarananda. Then uh, from Allahabad, one magazine was being published by Brahmos. So those magazines were there. There was a strange thing that in our house, the Brahmos were called Bemo. Since we are we were Brahmins, although in Imlitala, they allowed those people to come into our house, allowed us to go to their house, but they called the Brahmos Bemo. Bemo because they were not Brahmins. They had left the Hinduism <coughs> and started their own religion. In a house, it means my elder uncle, Pramod, and my grandmother. These two people were against the, the Brahmos. My mother was not against it because my mother came from a completely different family who were all, all educated. My maternal uncles and maternal grandfather all were educated. <coughs> anyway, we... Uh, came to know that they didn't like uh, Bemos. And even uh, Tagos songs were prohibited in our house. But nobody knew about the Tagos songs. My elder sisters used to learn classical songs. But somehow, somewhere they picked up Tagos songs and sang it in our house and everybody liked it. it then I uh, took my parents and my sisters, elder sisters and uncles to my school in a function. That is Poila Boisha function. At that time, the, uh, this Rovindo Songit was sung and everybody liked it. And then they came to know that Rovindo Songit was quite good and it was quite soothing and they liked it and then allowed it to be sung in our home. Then they purchased uh, Tago songs and other songs. Prior to that, we, uh, the, we had a gramophone record also. Gramophone record brought from Uttarpara. It's a very old gramophone record. And we had lots of gramophone records. And since nobody used it, they were stuck with one another. 
all very old Brahman was. Veera Bai stuck with Gaur Jan <laughs> like, like that. Anyway, after we shifted to uh, uh, Dariyapur, Samir was uh, sent to Calcutta <coughs> because my father thought that Imlitala uh, will corrupt him because it was a, a different type of area. Sex was not controlled in that area and <coughs> people of lower caste families, they will try to entice upper class, fair complex and boys. So my father sent Samir to Calcutta and uh, in my maternal uncle's house, Samir used to stay at Panihati, not in Uttarpara, because our Uttarpara house has it was a Jamindari house <coughs> and had become dilapidated with lots of banyan trees growing on its roofs. Samir started studying in a city college in uh, Calcutta and was staying in Panihati. Every day he used to go to city college in steam engine trains. At that time, electric trains were not there. And steam engine trains didn't have specific timetables. They were very slow. Anyway, he used to go through Shialla station. Shialla station at that time was like a village uh, station, not what you see nowadays. Nowadays, it is a very big station with lots of lights and <coughs> lots of people. At that time, the station was flooded with refugees. You cannot imagine the number of refugees staying in the station. It was horrible. That is, you will start, at our age, we will start crying looking at them. But every day he used to pass through it. Whenever I went to meet Samir, I also used to pass through it. And those refugees were having uh, processions in Calcutta. But it seemed that nobody is listening to them. At that time, Samir <coughs> thought that we should start some sort of a movement. Like Dirojio had started, we should initially we thought that our movement will be a social movement. But gradually it became a literary movement because for social movements you require the social activists which we did not get. We got only persons interested in literature, that is those who wrote poems, mostly those who wrote poems. And afterwards we got from Banaras uh, some artists <coughs> Anil Karanjai, uh, Karuna Nidhan Mukhopadhyay, and uh, some other artists also. These artists <coughs> were leftists. Some were, uh, Karuna Nidhan Mukhopadhyay had become a Naxalite also after leaving Angi generation. Anil Karanjai also had a left-leaning, uh, what shall I say, he was a Marxist, <coughs> but not a leftist. But their den was, during the Naxalite movement, their den was destroyed by the Banaras police and they fled away to other places. I'm going astray from the men in this thing. Anyway, Karunaridhan came to Patna at that time. He shaved his head, he changed his name, and he started wearing dhoti. And Samir opened his. Uh, a fish shop for him, colored fish shop. <coughs> you can take a pause, Molo, if you like. Huh? You can take a pause if you like. Yes, I do not don't talk so much now. Well, you've you've given us a very wide picture of uh, where we can find also the origins of the obscenity. Uh, that a lot of people have been talking about, right? You were the hungry generation became famous, especially after the trial and the sentence for obscenity in 1964. Here, see the people you see in the photographs, they were all my friends, Patna friends, 
all Patna friends, and you can find out <coughs> what Inglitola looks like. You are the one in the middle, right? Uh, I am in the middle. I mean, it's very easily recognizable. And do you know where this picture was taken? Diga or some, some place nearby the sea? Yes, in... I see it. My Sorry? Ganges River. Oh, oh yeah, okay, <laughs> then I had the idea. Good. So yeah, I was saying that um, this aspect of transgression. No, you've you've told us a lot of uh, events and a lot of anecdotes that, yeah, in a way, tell us uh, about a very transgressive um, oh, yeah. social social picture. Uh, you you've tell us about uh, corruption, refugees, and um, a lot of communities that were non Bengali speakers in the area where you were living. Um, so uh, this aspect of language, I think language is very important, right, for writers, but uh, perhaps even more for South Asian writers uh, who must struggle among different traditions and uh, literary cultures when they have to put their thoughts into words. Uh, but what is interesting is that despite um, all the hype with the West and Western, if you pass me the word, uh, you made, I think, the political decision of writing in Bengali, of choosing to write in Bengali, despite all the influences from the Hindi, spe Hindi Urdu speakers and the Bhojpuri songs and all that. So why uh, did you choose to write in? Did you choose to write in Bengali? And uh, uh, how transgressive was the Bengali that you chose to write your poetry in? No, I didn't have command over Hindi or English. Mm -hmm. That is why I started. And moreover, I went to a Bengali school, got influenced by <coughs> Bengali teachers, Bengali friends, Bengali books. Our uh, <coughs> syllabus were all in Bengali. Teachers were Bengali. They were teaching mathematics and science also in Bengali. So, I got a good command over Bengali and I started writing in Bengali. Started write, I had initially started, tried to write in English. Oh. The manifestos also, first few manifestos I wrote in English, you will find, because here is a picture of Devi Rai's family. You can find his parents, his wife, his younger brother, Devi Rai, would expect. Devi Rai means his original name is Aradon Dara. And that is the uh, area in which he lived. He also lived in a slum at that area. And his uh, uh, Aradon Dara's house was uh, <coughs> the uh, address of the Hungry Generation bulletins. Now, I uh, wrote some of the some of the first manifestos in English because there was no Bengali press uh, available in Patna. The Bengali press, which were available, they only published, they only printed those birthday cards or uh, funeral cards. They had set languages. It was not possible. But I thought that I should start the movement. I should start writing. I wrote, uh, I think, several uh, uh, <coughs> uh, several bulletins in English. But afterwards, <coughs> a lot of people said that there is a lot of incorrect English in there. In, in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, like, Olokranjan Dajgupta said that the English is not correct. We should, uh, uh, then we discontinued in Bengali. Then Devi Rai started getting it printed in uh, Bengali in Calcutta. <coughs> Devi Rai's work was to collect whoever came to his house to contribute because we didn't say that uh, who should be a member, Any, anybody and everybody was free to print his poem with the Hungry, <coughs> hungry Generation bulletin written on the uh, Here you see the Hungries, all, all the Hungries are there who 
were able to gather at that time. Some of them are not there, like Sumar Masal, Pradeep Mitro, Alu Mitro, Suvajar, Pradeep Chaudhary, they are not there in this picture. <coughs> but some uh, others are there. I was always wondering what is this uh, thing in the middle? I, actually, I really cannot recognize. Is it a fountain? Yes, it is a fountain. Okay, so not, nothing transgressive as I was expecting. The fountain, I think water is also pouring out from it. <coughs> but this tension with the English language is very interesting. I always had the idea that when I saw your first manifest on poetry, which is actually in the pictures, if we can try to scroll it down and um, find the... Yeah, okay. So yeah. this is the first yeah, manifest. The names, are, names of those who have participated are there. I always thought that it was a, um, it was your intention actually to write the first manifesto in English for matters of visibility and of circulation, which eventually happened, right? Thank, I would say, uh, thankfully that uh, there were, there wasn't any, any Bengali script press uh, so that we can have a manifesto in English and eventually you kind of circulated the whole avant-garde scene in the US and in Europe too now so that we have um, actually a, a document that is easily readable across the world. Uh, no? This is quite interesting because in Bengal we were not being accepted. <laughs> in Calcutta we were not being accepted. But because of these manifestos, which were in English, it, re it reached other languages in India. And in other languages, we were accepted. In other languages, we were able to influence also. In Hindi, in Marathi, in Assamese, <coughs> in Gujarati, these manifestos were able to convey us but in Calcutta, we were not accepted. Though no. Neviroy started printing some of the Bengali, uh, Bengali poetry manifesto is also there. It was published after a few after, after a few months of this one. It was mostly a translation of the English one. Interestingly, no, no, it was... It is not a translation. No. It is a completely different, mm, different version. Uh, anyway, these uh, reached... Europe reached America, reached Latin America. And as you have seen, you yourself have found out these things in various uh, universities in uh, America or Europe, in <coughs> archives of various poets. So these were quite helpful and it allowed us to reach to various places. <coughs> allowed us, uh, and whatever was being written in Bengali and Hindi, along with our photographs, these created another problem in Calcutta. People tried to suppress us, but <coughs> since most of the uh, articles written in Hindi were by uh, Known, known writers like Anishwar Nath Renu wrote about us along with our photographs. Then uh, one was Agir, S.H. Vatsayan Agir, who was, who was quite famous. He also used to edit a magazine from Delhi. I forget the name. Then Kamaleshwar, Srikant Varma, Buddha Rakshas. These people, people started writing about us. <laughs> but in Calcutta, they were writing against us. You have yourself seen what Jyotir Mahadatta, who was my witness in the case, he had written a very big article in Desh. I don't remember the title. Mandriji Saite Khudito Bangsho or something mm -hmm. like that. Ah. He wrote a lot of things. He wrote against us even in American magazine uh, of Dick Bakken, Salted Feathers, he wrote there also. But afterwards, he, I don't know, got soft hearted. He became my uh, witness. He introduced me to the uh, barrister in the High Court. 
<laughs> that was quite helpful because barrister used to charge every time and it was very difficult for me. This one, you see this hungry generation bulletin. This was the uh, bulletin which was <coughs> seized by the police and the names they are written. Uh, uh, warrants were issued against these people, these 11 people. Samir was the publisher. So Samir's name is not there, but as a as publisher, his name was there. And we uh, were all arrested because of the, uh, this bulletin. Because of, I think from the letters that uh, Alu Mitra and Tridhi Mitra had uh, published, you will see the conspiracy was going on in Calcutta much earlier than this bulletin was published. That they, they were thinking of taking action against us before my poem was published or this bulletin was published. Here you see the photographs of the Amelius. Here you see uh, on extreme left seated is Subimal Basan, who is not there in the photograph. And two uh, outsiders are there in the middle is David Garcia and Sharad, uh, I think, uh, right is Sharad Dora. Sharad Dora was the person who used to uh, edit a magazine, edit a magazine called Ganoda from Calcutta. He is a, a Marwari, he had a, Marwari's had a, <coughs> had Gandhis, that is, the business people had in their drawing room they will be having a very big bed. That is, in Calcutta, I was not having places uh, during the night. So I used to take shelter in Sharadora's Gaddi. And like other business people coming to Calcutta, sleeping there, I also used to sleep there in his Gaddi. And in let the. Me, Moloy, Moloy da, let me just make a sh short addition on this. Um, on the previous manifestos that we saw, the manifesto and um, the bulletin, Hungry Generation. Unfortunately, I couldn't add more picture, but there are a lot of uh, examples of all the materials that the Hungry Generation was using. And I thought of sharing it with you also to give a material, a concrete idea uh, to the students also of how the materiality of uh, avant-garde was important, right? We are talking about an avant-garde movement and the idea of printing very on very cheap paper, very low cost um, and self-financial, self-financed papers. Um, it was very important also to the idea of being an avant-garde movement itself. No, something that was easily printable in a few copies and distributed at um, gathering places like the Indian Coffee House and other places outside the university. Um, so yeah, another thing that I, wanted, I wanted to ask you, um, talking about the trial and sentence for obscenity, which paradoxically is also the event that made you known across the world. Uh, it, it is especially after that moment that you came in touch with a, with a huge scene, avant-garde scene from Europe and from the US. And this is where all the correspondences and the letters um, um, actually have been gathered. Um, um, so information on those days is uh, pretty much confused and often concocted um, in the same way I would say that your encounter with Allen Ginsberg um, and the extent of literary influence, right, uh, that happened between the two movements, as Orko said, a dialogic um, influence, uh, has quite naturally brought to the assumption that Hungarism came after the beats or that the Hungarians came out as an imitation of the, hung of the American beatniks. And how do you explain that this is uh, so still today, so much part of our popular knowledge on the hungry generation, although a lot of people that have read your writings, of course, know that it's a completely much more complex interaction that happens between not only two movements, but within a whole, um, a whole web, a whole network of, um, of interaction. Here, the photograph which you see is of Nepali poets. 
that is we had gone there to nepal on the invitation of one pasu shashi <coughs> in this picture we are there and below you can see anil karanjai and uh, karuna nidhan mukhopadha and samir is on the right side sunwal basak is standing there <coughs> now uh, see if people thought that we were very educated and we will be knowing about the beats i don't know how uh, people thought that beat literature will be reaching calcutta just as it was reaching other places in america alan ginsberg's howl and kadish was sent to me by lawrence ferling at the after ginsberg visited my house in 1963 none of the others had met ginsberg uh, other members other than me and samir none of them them had met ginsberg kritibash words had met ginsberg because ginsberg was going to coffee house and meeting them and most of the hungarians they didn't uh, go to coffee house so much they visited khalasi tola most of the time <laughs> so thinking that they were educated and they had good command over english and will get books from books of the beat movement i don't know how people uh, took it so simply it is of course even now you will go you can go to calcutta and ask people whether they have read beat words they will tell you that they uh, have read in translation or beat magazines also were not available at that time for the first time when we wrote in lawrence filling at his magazine those magazines were sent to us and we came to know the writers there lawrence filling at he used to send books and howard mccord also used to send books but that was afterwards after we became became because of the trial became famous those books were reaching us mm-hmm. thinking of uh, getting influenced by allen ginsberg or by the beat poets i think if you read our our books uh, our uh, stories our novels you will find them completely different from the way beats have written even our sentences are completely different Our, our breath span a bengali breath span is completely different from a beatnik from an american uh, breath span so our poems are completely different as far as sexual imagery is are concerned i think all of us came from a different background you will find shailesh sir ghosh's poem the completely complex poems but using imagery sexual imagery then suhas ghosh's uh, stories or avanidhar stories who was uh, in a ship so you will get uh, their own experiences there since they are experience they have utilized their experience they have brought stories from their life so you will get sexual imagery is there also but they are not like what ginsberg or uh, other people had none of us were homosexuals in hungry generation group the all were normal and here you see uh, a picture of uh, subho acharya that is with, uh, this is this is the this the front co- the front cover of um uh, uh, a special issue yes a special uh, issue on angrelism that was published from um magazine Salted called Salted Feather yes exactly. that's published in Dick Parker from Portland uh, Ohio he published it now subho acharya he became a disciple of a god man Anukul Thakur, his name is Anukul Thakur. You can imagine the type of people uh, who were in the movement. 
all were not the same they were completely different in character now subhimal basak was a completely different a person uh, this is the order of the court court order which <coughs> gives me uh, one month uh, sentence or rupees 200 fine 200 was the maximum at that time that is uh, the judge has fined me the maximum amount at that time now it has been raised i think to 5000 or something but this is and the judge has written reasons also the judge completely depended upon his own ideas of writing he didn't uh, listen to what sunil gangopadhyay or shakti chattopadhyay or the uh, witnesses for and against me the judge did not listen to them the judge uh, took uh, evidences from them which related to his own logic that is he said ha ah, he has said that he saw malay to be distributing it he saw malay and writing and all the rest the judge decided to convict me i think after reading the poem itself <coughs> good so um um we have seen that of course there are different um there is a similar spirit in the whole avant-garde scene we can see also um yeah a similar spirit during the 60s generally speaking although it draws and hails from different experiences and different localities and i think that this um um idea of encounter and circulation as well as translation which is something that you've been doing throughout your life and recently we've seen a lot of uh, Uh, books coming out um especially for example lately you've translated uh, rambo the french poet in bengali right so translation is a very key issue in in the in the hungry movement uh, together uh, they had trans i think suhash and uh, pradeep they had translated uh, ato 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 was there na no? french uh, ato mm -hmm. Yes, we are. Yes, I have translated Atos, and I have translated lot of poets, lots of poets. The lady beat poets are not being translated in Bengali. Nobody knew that there were so ladies in beat movement. So I translated almost all of them, and now a book is being published from Tripura, uh, which will uh, contain all the ladies of the beat, beat movement. Yes, I was saying since we are um, talking about um, global modernism, right, and all these issues that are very important to um, to this huge category that contains very different voices. Um, another relevant category uh, that pops up is that of canon, canon and tradition, uh, yeah. or which were the models, for example, of the hungry generation. So when we talk of the hungry generation we know that their intention was the opposite was to break with traditions and with the norms of uh, especially of Bengali modernism and when we say that we generally um refer to Tagore for example who is the greatest icon of the of uh, of Bengal generally speaking in, in all fields of culture in fact one of your uh first declarations was to move away uh from Tagore which means also to reject lyricism and romanticism um specifically um in terms of modernism the hungry generation is played out within and outside modernism in a way because you can see that on the one hand um um you have looked at many great icons from the western canon especially rebellious icons like rambo and baudelaire who in fact you have translated while on the other hand you've also like i have written about their life i have translated them i have translated rambo's both poems illuminations and season and hell i have translated uh, 
Baudelaire's novel, La Fafarlo, and I have oh. translated Baudelaire's uh, uh, prose poems, which I think Baudelaire uh, wrote, I don't remember. So my question was, have you tried to move away from um, modernism? Actually, an idea of modern. I think you've been writing about this a lot in your essays. A modern modernity that is Eurocentric and that's uh, oriented towards progress, right? You've written a lot about postmodernism, something that you have named uh, utoradhunic or adhunantic. So the idea of the end of the modern is very present, uh, perhaps in your later works more than in your in the poetry of the hungry generation. Adhunantic, the word adhunantic was coined by Prabal Dasgupta. The linguist Prabal Dasgupta. Dasgupta. He said Adhunantik is a bus stop. That is, you reach a bus stop where the modernism stops and you get down from the bus and start walking wherever you want to go. So modernism stops and you start walking according to your own idea to various uh, paths, whatever path you select. So in this period, I have, I don't know whether you have uh, read my Nam Gondho, novel Nam Gondho, where I, I mixed a lot of uh, genres or genres, that is, I mixed up novels, diaries, and the plight of jute workers and uh, the dead bodies departing and uh, being sold and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the actual condition of, uh, that is modernism stops and then you start walking towards wherever you find your way or you get lost to a part of, you get lost, your uh, way gets lost, or you get lost. So similarly, uh, the poems I wrote afterwards also, you will find the poems don't end. They just stop somewhere, and after that, the reader may think wherever he wants to go. That uh, Uttur Adhunik was uh, not uh, Samir said that it is not a correct word. The Udhunantik coinage was proper. So we use Udhunantik. We called it postmodernism, but we use the word Udhunantik to show that modernism ends. That is not modernism of the West, I should say. Because modernism of the West came with their culture, no? You can't uh, separate modernism of the West from the Western culture. But in our country, the culture is completely different. I don't know whether you have gone to Puri and seen Jagannath Temple. I don't know, foreigners are not allowed. In Jagannath Temple, you will find the deities are, the deities were there from I don't know, several centuries earlier, but all are, all look surrealist. The deities are surrealist. Surrealist deities. They look surrealist long before Salvador Dali and Andre Breto thought about them. So Indian culture has to be taken into account when you think about our writing. Or even if you go to the temples, I have got, I had written a story about, about a person who was informed during the Marxist rule to get out of the Khajuraho temple. He was a stone, he was in shape of a stone in Khajuraho temple. But a mosquito came and informed him that the Marxists have invited him and he is to be he should be present there. So that a person for 900 years, he was 
in the stone form in a sexual position with several ladies he jumped out of that as a human being and gradually started his journey towards towards i have not named calcutta but towards calcutta so our uh, stories take into account certain things which is not possible in the west to take into account this person becomes small becomes big so he was he became very small so that he was picked up by by an eagle and when the eagle picked it up he saw that in the other hand of the eagle the lord krishna was there in metallic shape because the eagle was cleaning the lord krishna's well metal uh, idol the well metal idol told uh, uh, this person that let us jump together after some time we will get the house where laddus are being pre prepared we will jump and go inside the laddus and we will conceal ourselves there so our stories take into account our histories i don't know uh, this is not magic realism these are our histories you will get lots of things of magic realism in krishna's lives or in ramayana or mahabharat or other indian uh, what shall i say other sanskrit stories you will get them i have uh, this is my 50th marriage anniversary photograph my son and daughter gave us a gave us a surprise visit without informing us that they are coming and okay. we do not generally celebrate we do not set up much celebrate our birthday or anything i celebrated my first birthday with my granddaughter at dubai that is for the first time i get cut a cake at the age of 80 can you imagine an indian cutting a cake at the age of age of 80 for 80 years this western custom was not there this western custom i played in when i became 80 because of my grandchildren and my grandchildren uh, they do not speak bengali they speak only american english they are uh, in dubai they can't speak bengali they are culturally more uh, american or british than us but anyhow they uh, my elder uh, granddaughter prepared who is studying now in oxford university at that time she was in dubai she prepared a cake for me and i cut my first birthday cake at the age of 80 and in that photograph you saw my uh, daughter and son they gave us a surprise visit they didn't tell us that they will be coming they gave us a surprise visit and took us for lunch to a local restaurant so the way uh, i should say the way we uh, we indians live or spend our lives is completely different from uh, from the modern way of life or post modern way of life in the western world our way of life is completely different or our thinking also is completely different and my uh, novels and stories are not all same same type of they are completely different i write when i feel like that i have to write something different similarly you will find others like kudip choudhury or uh, subhimal boshak subhimal boshak wrote for the first time in the language of what is being written in bangladesh as bangladeshi bangla 
Subimal Basak wrote it in 1965. That is his novel, Chhatamatha. The narrative is completely written in uh, Bangladeshi Bengali. But the dialogues there are in West Bengal Bengal or Calcutta's Bengali. But nowadays, they are claiming, in Bangladesh, they are claiming that they have started their own Bengali, which is, uh, shall I say, not correct. We had started it long ago. That is, the you were talking of Rogindranath or say, others. Nobody ever thought that the language itself, the narrative itself, may be completely different. The narrative may be written in the language of his house, the language in which, which he talked with his mother, with his wife, uh, with his sisters, brothers. So he wrote Chhatamatha in that language. Similarly, if you uh, take Falguni Rai, Falguni Rai came from a Zamindar family. They were very rich, but became very poor and started selling their marble floors, pick, picking up, up marble floors and selling the marbles in the market. They were became very poor. Nobody was doing anything. You see, Falguni Rai's poems, those poems are not what be, was being written at that time. And I think that such poems have not been written in the West also. In a, in a comical way, the poet negates himself and writes poems in a completely different way. The poet touching his nose with his tongue and says that he is a okay. genius. Thank you, Molloy. Orko, do we have like one minute for a last question? Yeah, maybe, maybe we can have a last question before we open it up. Sorry, I'm just aware of time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, sorry if I'm perhaps uh, moving to another realm, but this is a quite uh, pressing question for me. Um, talking about, since obscenity is also in the title of, uh, of this talk, I thought that um, it was important also to ask about um, one of the main criticism that has been um, made on the hungry generation is the question of misogyny, right? There is a very um, heavy, I would say, um, hyper masculinity or kind of performance of hyper masculinity and of a predatory um, masculinity, if you like. Um, although there are many um, social and historical reasons, of course, that could explain that. Uh, it is true that um, the Hagwis played out a lot on, on, you know, on objectified female bodies, especially in their poetry. And this is something that comes up quite starkly in your, in your poem, Sarki Electric Jesus, for example. Um, I think it's interesting also to talk to you right now um, about uh, a Molloy who is not there anymore, a Molloy who was writing those poems in his uh, 20s, I think, right? So it would be interesting also to ask you right now, what, how do you explain that? How would you also defend yourself somehow from this criticism if you look back at, at that Molloy, the, like the wild poet of the hungry generation writing about this, um, uh, with with a with a very uh, evident and a very clear masculine gaze onto the female body. Of course, this is not something that uh, has to do with you. It's it's a very um, it's a thing I think in in modernism, generally speaking. But yeah, what what would you say about that? See, one lady who criticized me, she said that all the Hungarians are trying to prove that they are alpha males. <laughs> they are alpha males they are trying to prove in their uh, poetry. That is poetry written during the 60s. Later on, they mellowed down and started writing differently. But at that time, I think because of our age, uh, because of our, of our age and because of the 
surroundings which was some sort of a jail house that is a jail house society in which we were living so as a result of that this alpha male character might have emerged in our writings and the obscenity uh, portion i think this also emerged from our own surroundings that is we came from such backgrounds where these were not considered to be obscene and moreover uh, for certain words like you had said or some other people have also written like thought shown or copulation or what it is called now what bengali word could one write the bengali word equivalent at that time and even now is obscene and nobody writes it very rarely people write and i am told that some people who wrote it they were rejected by the presses or the compositors who were composing them the digital composer they said that they are not going to write such words so i think uh, because of that this alpha male might have come in almost all in mind solyashar ghosh solyashar ghosh is more alpha male than me and falguni roy and subo acharya would to be alpha male i think tridhi mitra also will not be an alpha male but some of us did our avani for in his stories to be an alpha male otherwise i don't have any other explanation that at this age i can't explain yeah it's interesting also one could say that it was also a reaction to the middle class morality of that time right the sort of more also an ideology that was very much promoted in the 60s of savings that's actually something that all the the whole middle class all over the world has shared especially during that time um of knowing how to behave of how to conform to the norm uh so i think that also perhaps in this uh, transgressing the gender uh, dichotomies also in a very unpleasant way sometimes the hungrylists were actually practicing and performing uh provocation or um, you know sh- something that has to be shocking to the middle class so by um, putting into words everything that was inappropriate during that time that was their transgression and this is how i've tried to explain that also as this, as a female reader actually of your poetry this poem of mine is more popular in bangladesh i have seen bangladeshi ladies some bangladeshi ladies have recited this poem and put it on youtube but here in uh, west bengal so far i think ladies have not have come forward to read it and put it on youtube but in bangladesh yeah, there is a, a site also going on for about 12 to 13 years which deals with this poem only and people are still com- commenting on this poem and some of the lines are still being lines of the poem are still being used by people even by ladies so this poem uh, i don't know uh, some critics have uh, written that this poem has destroyed me because of this poem people don't read my other poems or other novels other stories and i read lot of i write lot of essays i have i have got lot of books on uh, i collected articles there are some several some 10 12 books are there they are sold also but they are not discussed much as it should have been novels are discussed 
but this poem is discussed too much. <laughs> I agree with that. That's also the power of poetry, right? Everybody takes what they want from it. I think that's that's very interesting. Well, thank you very much, Molloy. I think I've uh, I should uh, finished all my questions. I should thank you because you have made me world famous. <laughs> it's not only up to me, unfortunately. Thank you so much. It was such an engaging, absorbing conversation. In fact, interestingly, as of course Malada would know, uh, this poem is now part of the syllabus in, in some places in Bengali literature, Start Electric Jesus. Isn't it, Malada? Yes. Yeah. In Kalyani, with the university, they have already printed the syllabus. Right. Indicating that it is a part of postgraduate Bengali. Right. And I think that's quite interesting how uh, anti canonical or counter canonical writing. Uh, becomes canonized or becomes absorbed by the canon after a certain number of years. But I think this is a good point to maybe open this up. I'm sure there might be many questions because it was a very interesting journey we talked about, not just literature, but also the social, the political, the anthropological reality of uh, a writer like you growing up in the 60s and the kind of shifts we saw because there is a very strong presence of a post-hungry Molloy Roy Choudhury as well in his novels. And it's interesting how the choice of genre was primarily poetry, for you at least, in the hungry generation years, whereas you started writing novels in a much more forefrontal way and you have a very substantial corpus of novels. I mean, my personal favorite would be the trilogy, uh, Dub Jolly Jetuku Prashash, uh, Nam Gondho and Jolanjoli. But I'm also extremely fond of some of the other genre experiments, like that extremely interesting detective novel that you wrote, and and also a novel erotic. like, on, right, an erotic novel also. I wrote. Yes, yes, Orup uh, Tomare Tokata. That's the erotic novel. And again, these are extremely complex forms as well that you use. I mean, something that you already pointed out. Uh, this hybrid form of novels and diaries, and it's there in Nokhodonto as well. Another novel. Yeah that uses all these interesting cut up, uh, sort of uh, the, the cut up form, so to speak. Again, it's, it's, I mean, we could have a lot of discussion on that, but I don't want to take center stage. So let me just open it up for questions. So questions, please, I would request everyone to unmute themselves. If possible, switch on their videos. Uh, if not, it's all right. Uh, just unmute yourself, please, and ask the question. Uh, I don't see anything on the chat box and I think I would rather prefer if we have a dialogue, a verbal dialogue, right? So it'll be great if you could uh, ask your questions, unmuting yourselves. Thank you. Questions, please. Questions, comments, anything. Maybe I'll give it a minute for people to gather their thoughts. I also wanted to point out two interesting reference points for the name Hungry. And maybe Malayda can add to this. I, I read this in your own writings that you refer to at least two sources there and very interesting sources which go back to the discussion we had. Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West is one and uh, Chaucer's use of the word Hungry, the Sour and Hungry Times is another. Uh, it's interesting because, again, in Spengler, we have this idea of uh, going against the progressive model of modernity, right, that you talked about. So I was just interested in the choice of the word hunger. Linearity of, the Abrahamic linearity of time, it differs from uh, the history's interpretation of the Abrahamic linearity of time, which Marx accepted and other people accepted. But he said that it is, it is not like that. It branches out differently in different ways. Right. I also wrote that it branches in Bengali, it branched out as Tagore, as Michael Madhusudan, as Najrul. And Najrul got uh, what I said by the modernists, they didn't accept Najrul. They thought he was not in the in the linear uh, path that they described. Yeah. Partially because of his religious identity as well. There was a very strong... And the way he wrote. Yeah. 
Yes, so right. he was accepted by Bangladesh. Right. So Bangladesh formed a different linearity of its religion. Right. There, the other writers are being dropped out. Right. I'll, I'll take a just one moment, go to the toilet. And oh, sure, out. sure, please. Yeah, of course. In fact, in the meantime, uh, maybe the audience members, if they have a question, uh, we can relay the question to Malayda once he comes back. But yeah, I have a question, Orko, but I can uh, ask him directly when once he comes sure, back. Sure. sure. And in case you're more comfortable, I mean, I'm just talking to anyone here uh, of the participants. I mean, in case you're more comfortable writing it down in the chat box, of course, feel free to do so. I just would have thought it's better to ask the question verbally, but if you prefer writing it down, that's perfectly fine. Uh, it's a good breathing uh, point we have here. In fact, uh, it's it's interesting. I mean, uh, maybe there could be a whole different discussion about the, the novels, I feel. And in fact, it's interesting. I mean, my own encounter with Smaller Rai of course, I knew the name primarily because of the hung realism connection, but I should say I was asked to write a uh, what became an extremely long essay, almost a 35 page essay in Bangla for this little, little magazine called Opor. Uh, and the name is interesting because Opor is other in Bangla. Uh, and again, as we could see in this very interesting discussion, uh, we have all these openings across uh, caste lines, which, which uh, you know, in a way diversifies the canon of Bengali literature which was not just Brahmo, as, as Malayada was saying, but also very Brahminical. I mean, uh, it was primarily literature produced by the Chattopadhyas, the Bandhapadhyas, the Gangopadhyas. I mean, we could just go on forever. But it's interesting how uh, possibly because of the legal trial, as, as uh, both Malayada and Daniela were talking about, how it kind of catapulted to a certain degree of fame, and that enabled the movement to perhaps go on for a certain number of years. But it's also interesting how we see, uh, apart from uh, Shubhimal Boshak and Basudev Dashgupto, the preferred uh, choice of genre was primarily poetry. And it's quite interesting. In the manifesto, it's all poetry. That, uh, In the English manifesto, at least, it's, it's almost all poetry. But uh, yeah, I mean, Onuparna, please go ahead with your question now that Malayada is back. Okay. Thank you. It was such a lovely talk. So uh, thanks a lot for again for organizing the, uh, this, and and uh, thanks a lot to Molaida and Daniela for this wonderful, you know, um, uh, sort of you know the session. So my question is primarily about you know uh, uh, Molaida has kind of you know delineated this very fraught relationship with Bengal. So you, you have on the one hand your influence, the subaltern influence that kind of inflected your writing, Imli Tala, uh, and and you kind of you identify your partially with the margins. So that inflected your writing. On the other hand, you, of course, which you mentioned in your novels, particularly your memoir, that your association with almost the first family of Bengal, if not. So again, that's that's the other extreme of it. So if you could also tell us something, because there are so many stories, anecdotes, you know, all kinds of, you know, you know, um, whatever, you know, interpretation, misapprehensions about this family. So if you could tell us how that inflected your your writing, I mean, uh, to an extent, because that's also a very important chapter of your life, which comes up, you know, uh, subsequently in your novels. So, yes, that's my question. Malayada, if you could please, yeah. That is Shaburno Choudhury family. <laughs> Shaburno Choudhury's are at present about 32,000. 32,000 Shaburno Choudhury's are there throughout the world, can imagine from one person that who, whose name was Lokhikanto Gongopadhyay. Mm. He was Lokhikanto Gongopadhyay. And he was a minister in Pratapadittu's uh, Joshur, uh, shall I say, Guiyas were kings or he himself uh, declared himself as a king. He was there as Lokhikanto Gongopadhyay. But afterwards, uh, when he, uh, because of his father, his father was had become a sadhu and uh, Man Singh loved him. So because of Man Singh, I think first Akbar and then Jahangir, they gave Roy 
and Chaudhary two times. Roy means I think you get uh, gold gold coins, and Chaudhary means you get landed property. So landed property was given, uh, which was Sundarbans at, at that time. Like later on, which became Calcutta and Govindapur and all those places. Most of these places were uh, people who resided were not upper caste. They were all uh, mostly of lower caste people. But even then, uh, they developed this area. The Britishers came. These Sabarno Chauduris became, became very rich. And as a result, they married also. Some of them were having six, seven wives, which was allowed at the, that time. Because of which it is now 32,000. It might be more also. But uh, Saburna Chauduris did not influence me. Even my grandmother, who used to stay in that dilapidated house alone, there were uh, pigeons, about 500 pigeons were there in that house. My grandmother used to say, see, these are all Saburna Chauduris. The Saburna Chauduris grow like this. And they have destroyed the entire clan. <laughs> the Saburno Chodhuris. Now, the Saburno Chodhuris are divided in various families in Bodhisha itself. And Durga Puja is celebrated in all the families. In the Bean family, uh, where uh, I had visited only once, at that time, uh, th this slaughter was going on. Uh, and you can't imagine the blood was being kept in earthen pots and uh, it was horrible, horrible for us. After that, I didn't go, uh, after that, when it stopped, they changed it to uh, slaughtering uh, bananas and uh, uh, goats and etc. Then uh, at that time, I had one. But after that, I have not gone uh, to that. Uh, I mean, with this Habarno Chodhuris, I don't have much uh, relations. Uh, I don't take, I don't participate in whatever they do. They are much more religious. I'm not a religious person, but they are much more religious. They perform lots of uh, all those, that is Ratho Jatra, then Rasa Jatra. And then Kali this uh, Kali of uh, Kali Ghat is by a Saburno Chaudhuri. Some Saburno Chaudhuri had uh, established it. As a result of which, for us, if we go and say that we are Saburno Chaudhuri, we are not, uh, we need not go into the line. We can straight away go and see the goddess. Since we are Saburno Chaudhuri. There is a shop also, which Sabarno Chaudhuri is go there and tell him that we are Sabarno Chaudhuri, then he will allow you to uh, meet the goddess straight away instead of through the line. But uh, I do not belong to this Sabarno Chaudhuri clan. I, I think I have developed my own clan of Angrialists. And <laughs> that is uh, reflected in my books. In my books also, this Sabarno Chaudhuri is don't come. Excepting for I had written in my Chotu Loka Chotuvala, I have written uh, a story about uh, how Lokthi Ganto Rai gradually became a uh, Rai Chaudhuri. The Rai Chaudhuri title was accepted and everyone accepted. But in the meantime, at one time, there was a Pachu Shokti Khan also. That is, that Rai Chaudhuri, instead of Rai Chaudhuri, uh, I think some Afghan or, I don't know, he had that Afghan cavalry, in charge of Afghan cavalry. He was Pachu Rai Chaudhuri, but he was given Shokti Khan. A Turkish Khan is a Turkish title. He was called Shokti Khan, Pachu Shokti Khan. But afterwards, nobody used that Shokti Khan. Or I would have become a Molay Shokti Khan today. This is a Pachu 
this is our Rai Chaudhary. So I do not have much affiliation with the Rai Chaudhary family. Or I, I simply carry their blood. Otherwise, I do not have much to do with the Rai Chaudhary. Thank you so, so much. In, in, uh, in our Uttapada house, uh, all those things were there. Uh, that is, all Farsi books were there. My grandfather knew Farsi and Arabic much more than Bengali and Sanskrit. So all those things were there. Mm. Books were there. Unfortunately, we did not preserve. We did not uh, know that someday people will come and talk to us like Orko Chorta Chortobadai and we will be asked about our forefathers. Otherwise, we will have we should have kept them. We did not have an idea of history, I think. In our family, nobody had the idea of history. That is why these pamphlets also, these booklets, you don't want to get all of them anywhere. More than 100 booklets and pamphlets were published. They are freely issued. You get them in foreign countries, but you don't get them in India. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mollad. In fact, it is such a rich cultural history we are talking about of a family. And uh, even though, as you said, you may not belong uh, culturally to that family or you may not identify with the family, it's very interesting how this backdrop, in a way, enriches uh, your writings as well as the, the whole movement in a, in a certain way. Uh, if we, I mean, I think we, we've kind of gone out of time here, but is there one last question? I'm happy to take one last question, maybe, uh, from the floor. Anyone? Uh, I'm looking at the chat box. No, not anything there. So if, if there's one last question, we could take that. Otherwise, we will call this session to a close. Maybe I'll give it 20 seconds. <laughs> I think people are not aware of the movement. I think your students yes, yes, are not, to a certain extent. In fact, that was, yeah. You may at least read that Moitri Bhattacharya book. Yes. The Hungry List. Right. And that's a book that yeah, that's a that's a book very easily available, by the way. It's it's published by Penguin and all of you are you know more than welcome to kind of And it has become cheaper also. also. Original price was around 600. Now it is available at 150 also. Right, right, right. Amazon. Right. Yes, I mean, one of the problems, one of the problems behind the Indian dis dissemination of this movement has been the lack of translation of the works. Uh -huh. And uh, that's something that I think all of us uh, should work on culturally in that sense. Uh, thank you so much to both uh, Daniela and Moloeda for devoting so much time to this. It was just an initial idea that I had pitched to both of you, and it's very kind of you to do this. In fact, that was one of my uh, interests behind the movement, to create a certain kind of awareness about the Hungry Realists as a movement, and also within this very complex global network of modernisms, each of which are independent in a way, right? I mean, they are coeval, they are independent. Sometimes we forget the sort of, again, the counter Eurocentric chronology of some of some of these movements, as Daniela was pointing out. And I must say, it was wonderful to have an actual hungry generation scholar, which is clearly not what I am. And it was wonderful to have an actual hungry generation scholar uh, interview one of the central figures of this movement. And some of what we discussed, in fact, in this conversation is very rich, as I said, cultural, literary, as well as anthropological history. In fact, some of those questions about love and sexuality as well, for example, how it would have been different if uh, there was a gay writer in this in this group. You know, one of the points that Molaida was making there that the sexualities of this group, in that sense, orientation-wise, was normative, and as a result, again, we have a particular kind of a masculine gaze. I think another thing to think through would be somehow this relation between a political language of radicalism and masculinity. Because it's something that we see in a lot of Bengali literature post-Hungary as well, that the language of protest almost inevitably becomes a masculine language. And there's something to be said about that gender politics as well. Uh, I thank you, uh, 
on behalf of the department on behalf of everyone who's here thank you very much it was an absolutely wonderful conversation and a big honor to have you molaida and daniela to be able to do this from from naples i believe right is that right yes that's right. correct so thank you so much